Welcome to Revolutionary Gazette. I'm Will. Well, we're outside of Winchester, Virginia, and we're back at the Old Chapel Cemetery with Travis Shaw again. Last time we were here, we met Thomas Taylor Byrd, who made a choice in his life to stay loyal to the British during the American Revolution. Who do we meet today, Travis? So now we're going to talk about Edmund Randolph. Um, Edmund's fascinating because he comes from the same kind of social circle, social class as Thomas Byrd but he ends up making a very different decision when the Revolutionary War comes. So what choice does Edmund make? Uh, Edmund is gonna be very active in the Patriot movement in Virginia, um, both kind of militarily and especially politically as the, the Revolutionary War goes on and as we get into the early years of the Republic. Great, well, let's get there in a little bit, but let's go back to 1753. Let's start Edmund's life and bring just bring us up who he is and what roads lead him to make his decision. Sure, Edmund has a lot of similarities actually to Byrd. They're, they're born about a year apart, so kind of same generation, very same social class. Um, Edmund Randolph, again, is the son of, of a very, very prominent Virginia family. Um, his father, John Randolph, is active in Virginia politics. Um, his uncle, Peyton Randolph, as well. They're both going to be active as kind of uh, within the House of Burgesses here in Virginia, the, the government in Williamsburg. His grandfather, John Randolph, was actually Sir John Randolph, one of the only colonial Virginians to ever be knighted. So wow. very, very prominent family. Well, you mentioned the Randolph family. I guess we should say if you're looking for a connection to the Revolutionary War, you've already said Williamsburg, his uncle Peyton Randolph. That's a house you can still go visit. Right, absolutely. And it's a place where we know Edmund Randolph spent a lot of time as a young man. As Edmund Randolph really starts to get into his legal career as a young professional, you know, he's a student at William and Mary. Um, he's going to spend a great deal of time with his uncle Peyton. Peyton was the... Um, the Crown Attorney for uh, Virginia at one point. Very, very active in kind of the resistance to British taxation, British rule in Virginia in the, lead, the years leading up to the war. And so when the war breaks out, Edmund actually will break with his father. Um, his father, John, remains very loyal to the Crown. He actually writes a tremendous amount trying to convince Virginians to reconcile with the Crown. Whereas Edmund will join his, his uncle Peyton Peyton Randolph is going to be one of the leading voices at the Virginia Convention. Um, he's going to be one of the leading voices in the Continental Congress. And so Edmund is really going to fo follow in his uncle's footsteps rather than his father's. Um, again, just like with the birds, we're seeing a family that's being torn apart by the political choices that they face. Well, you talk about following in an uncle's footsteps, but a man has to walk his own steps Talk to me about Edmund's journey. Absolutely. So um, he's going to begin his Revolutionary War career as an aide to George Washington in 1775. But his military service is actually relatively brief. Uh, he's only in the army for a few months, and then he's going to resign to take up a position as the attorney general for Virginia. Um, so again, very prominent within kind of the legal circles of Virginia. That's going to lead in 1778, 79 to a position with the Continental Congress. It's 1779. He's a member of the Continental Congress. How do the war years end for him? Again, he's going to kind of use the Continental Congress as a, a political springboard to really establish his name. Right after the war, 1786, he becomes the governor of Virginia. And he also plays an important role uh, just a few years later when he's appointed to the Constitutional Convention. Um, he's one of the delegates representing Virginia. He's actually largely responsible for introducing what we know of as the Virginia Plan today, this plan for kind of a strong centralized government really based on population. He will split with a lot of his fellow delegates, though, when the issue finally comes down to voting for the Constitution. Um, How does he, he vote? So he is one of the few delegates that actually refuses to vote in favor of the Constitution. He's wary that there's a lack of checks and balances. Um, he doesn't see you know, enough safeguards for personal liberty. And so that's gonna make him a strong ally in the years to come with men like Patrick Henry and with George Mason, who are very much in favor of a Bill of Rights to kind of enshrine those protections in, in law. So, 
Edmund Randolph votes against the const adoption of the Constitution, what happens through the ratification period? So this is a really interesting period because he kind of does a flip. Um, when it comes time for Virginia to actually have its own convention to decide whether they're going to ratify this new Constitution, Randolph will be in charge of that convention down in Richmond, and he is going to take the opposite tack. Several states have already adopted the Constitution. Now he's worried that Virginia is going to kind of be left out in the cold. So he pushes his fellow delegates to ratify. Um, that's going to, to put him at odds with people like Patrick Henry, who see him as kind of betraying this cause that he had, he had argued for just a few years earlier. But it's largely through his personal influence that he's able to push the votes to get Virginia to adopt the Constitution. And as kind of part of this acceptance of this new government, he is going to take a position in Washington's cabinet. He becomes the first attorney general of the United States. And then just a few years later, when uh, Thomas Jefferson resigns as secretary of state, he's gonna take over as the second secretary of state. Fantastic. Well, we've talked about the war all the way on the East Coast. We've talked about Williamsburg politics. We've talked about politics that are in Philadelphia after the war through the Continental Congress. Why are we here in Winchester? The kind of post-government career of Edmund Randolph takes a lot of, of twists and turns. I like to refer to him as one of the forgotten founding fathers. I mean, he's this tremendous intellectual voice all throughout the, the early years of the Republic. But he's largely forgotten today, um, and there's several reasons for that. In 1807, he's going to play a prominent role in the treason trial of Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr has been accused of, of plotting to break the Western territories of the United States away. And this has put him at, at tremendous odds against Thomas Jefferson. Edmund Randolph is going to serve as part of Burr's defense, and that is really going to put him at odds with Jefferson, with a lot of the, the, the Democratic Republican Party at the time. Um, you know, of course, as a member of Washington's cabinet, he's kind of a, a Federalist. By the time that uh, he's nearing the end of his life in the 18, early 18 teens, he's really in the political wilderness at this point. He's not really well regarded by Jefferson and by the party of Jefferson. And so he's going to end up living out here with a uh, kind of a relation of his Nathaniel Burrell. Burrell is descended of the Carter family, owns Carter Hall just up the road from here, massive plantation. Randolph is going to spend the last few years of his life basically as a house guest of Nathaniel Burrell, and he's going to live out here in, in kind of relative obscurity, uh, and he dies in 1813. Interesting, as I listen to you talk about him defending uh, Burr from the treason, I'm harking back to the stories of John Adams defending the men who were British soldiers at the, what we now call the Boston Massacre. Sure. Yeah, I mean, one of the, the consistent threads that you see all the way through Edmund Randolph's life, from his young days as a student at William & Mary, all the way up to his service in the federal government, is that here's a man who absolutely believes in the rule of law, you know, and the equality of everyone before the law. You might not like Aaron Burr, but he deserves a fair trial, um, just like everybody else would. Fantastic. Well, a life very well lived. And here we also see the original stone and a stone that was put back in. Right. So the original tombstone is set up there. And then this 20th century stone, as well as the plaque here that lists a lot of his accomplishments, both, you know, in the government and also, you know, as Grand Master of the Masons of Virginia, certainly a prominent social role that he played in the 1780s as well. Well, let's look. This is the second of two episodes of men of similar means, of similar background, who made opposite choices at the American Revolution. Let's synthesize the experience of Thomas Taylor Byrd and Edmund Randolph. So again, you know, here's, here's two men who come from the Tidewater of Virginia, very established families, um, certainly some of the wealthiest, most politically connected families in Virginia. They're both you know, given every advantage that that entails. You know, they're given the best opportunities of education, they're given, you know, entry into the political and judicial centers of power in the colony. I think the, the difference is, as I said, you know, with Thomas Taylor Byrd, he's a military man. He's a man who's taken an oath. He's a commissioned officer in the army. Um, and he is going to, to stay true to that oath for better or for worse. A man like Edmund Randolph, though, as a young man in this kind of position, this social position, he sees the advantage that 
someone like him can have in a new nation, in a founding, establishing a republic, and really is solidifying himself as a great man in this kind of this new Republican government. Um, it's something that he shares with his second cousin, Thomas Jefferson. It's something that he's going to share with his uncle, Peyton Randolph. And they are really at the top of revolutionary politics in Virginia at the time. Well, Travis, thank you for bringing us here to the Old Chapel Cemetery and over two episodes telling us stories of two men who made radically different choices. Thank you for joining us at Revolutionary Gazette. These two episodes give you just a small example of the difficult choices that faced people in America in 1775 as the Revolutionary War looms. I hope you can use this to find a greater connection to our experience during the Revolutionary War. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. <laughs>